it is five o'clock. It is five o'clock and we will get the Board of Zoning Appeals site design July 7th, 2021 meeting underway. And uh, this is the virtual meeting protocol. Staff will control the slides displayed throughout the meeting. Applicant, staff, board members, and members of the public should give their name first whenever speaking. Applicants and members of the public must be sworn in before speaking for the first time. Only attendees who registered to speak before the deadline at noon today may speak during the meeting. Video and microphone have been disabled for all attendees. Attendees will only be given the capabilities to speak when they are called on during the public comment period. Board members who need to recuse themselves from voting will be temporarily removed from the meeting and readmitted prior to addressing the next item. If the board needs to go into executive session, they will call into a separate conference line and all video and audio on Zoom will be temporarily turned off until they are ready to return to the regular meeting. Obviously chat has been disabled for everyone and this meeting obviously is being recorded as it is a public hearing. I will now turn it over to Mr. Joel Adrian, our chairperson. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Eric. Um, the opening statement, this is the July 7th, 2021 meeting of the City of Charleston Board of Zoning Appeals site design. Uh, present are uh, Ruthie Ravenel, Amanda Barton, Paula Murphy, uh, Jeff Webb, uh, Calvin Yuji, Andrew Hargett, myself, Joel Adrian. Uh, present for the planning staff are Eric Schultz and Lee Batchelder, I believe is on. Right? Nope. Lee's no. not here tonight. Lee's okay. not here. He's on the beach. Uh, Scott Valentine, PRC coordinator. Um, okay. Eric Schultz and Scott Valentine. These proceedings are being recorded. We ask that those who speak identify themselves for the record. We will conduct this meeting in usual fashion. We will first receive information from city staff about the application and their recommendation. If the recommendation is favorable and no one objects to the application, uh, the Board of Zoning Appeals treats the matter as being uncontested and passes it as a matter of course. If, however, the city recommends against the application or there is opposition to the application, we treat the application as contested and hear from the applicant and anyone else who is in favor of the application. Next, we hear from anyone opposed, followed by a short rebuttal from the applicant. We then close the public hearing portion of the meeting for that particular application and open discussion to the Board of Zoning Appeals members only. We will then make the decision to approve, approve with conditions, or deny the application. The Board of Zoning Appeals site design has the authority to do three things. One, hear, hear appeals to decisions of the zoning administrator. Two, grant special exceptions, a fact-finding function of the board. And three, grant variances to the zoning ordinance if the application meets the hardship test outlined in section 54, 924 of the ordinance. The board may deliberate and make a final decision on a matter by a majority vote of members present at the hearing and qualified to vote, provided that not less than a quorum are present and qualified to vote. For a variance to be granted, the Board of Zoning Appeals must make the following findings. A, there are extraordinary and exceptional conditions pertaining to the particular piece of property. B, these conditions do not generally apply to other property in the vicinity. C, because of these conditions, the application of the ordinance to the particular piece of property um, would effectively prohibit or unreasonably restrict the utilization of the property. And D, the authorization of a variance will not be a substantial detriment to the adjacent property or the public good. And the character of the district will not be harmed by the granting of the variance. With that, I will send it back to Mr. Schultz. Very good, thank you. Uh, public comment, order on each application. The chair announces each application followed by staff presentation and recommendation. Staff will call on applicants to present their application after being sworn in by the chair. Staff will open the public comment period to receive comments from registered attendees in favor, first spoken, then written. Each speaker will be sworn in by the chair. Staff will then recognize registered attendees for public comments in opposition after a speaker is sworn in, first spoken, then written. Staff will recognize the applicant for a short rebuttal and then of course the chair will then close the public comment period and begin board discussion. If you have submitted a request to speak on an item before the deadline, staff will call your name when it is your turn to speak and enable your microphone. Your microphone will be disabled after you are done speaking and you may only speak 
once for each item. And you must state your name and address for the record or you will not be permitted to provide comment. For discussion, following public comment period, board members may make comments, ask questions and make motions. After a motion and a second, board members will vote aye in favor or nay, not in favor. If the vote is not unanimous, the chair will poll each member for their vote. The chairman shall announce the vote on the motion and the final decision on the application. If a board member needs to recuse himself or herself, they will be temporarily moved from the meeting and placed back into the meeting at the start of the next agenda. If the board needs to go into executive session, they will call into a separate conference line and all audio and video on Zoom will be temporarily turned off until they are ready to return to the regular meeting. And with that said, if there's anybody joining us from the general public just listening in, um, item A or B3, item B3, Fenwick Hall LA has been deferred, so it will not be heard tonight. Excellent. Mr. Chair. Um, okay, so our first item will be the approval of the minutes from June 2nd, 2021. Um, if there's any discussion or a motion. I hope that uh, I put, you know, the three sheets on one slide. I sent this to y'all and I hope based on whatever device you open it up, you can read them. But uh, what we do now is we, you know, put the variance, obviously the, the, uh, the motion approve or disapprove the conditions and then who made the motion second it and then how the vote, uh, you know, was uh, tallied. So any questions? I thought they looked fine. I make a motion we move to approve the minutes. I second. All right, so our motion is by uh, Ms. Barton. It'll be seconded by Mr. Yuji. Um, and, uh, and I'll just say all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed, say nay. Then the uh, motion is approved, uh, seven zero. So we'll go to our first item of uh, new business, which would be item B1, and that is 2 Ladson Street, um, application number 210707B1, TMS number 4571602023. Request a variance from section 54327 to allow the removal of one grand tree, um, zoned SR4. All right, very good, thank you. Okay, this is the application that was submitted uh, by the owner, John and Betsy Cahill, on the behalf of Wertimer and Klein Associates. This is a letter that was supported. I hope you all read it, but it gives you a little bit of history about when this particular tree was planted and the problems it is causing with a historic wall. The site is 2 Latson Street on the north side. It is zoned SR uh, two or three, I guess it is. I might have read two. Either way, uh, here's the house uh, aerial view. You can see the tree, a nice symmetrical crown in the northwest corner, just above the two cars. You can see a nice round circle of live oak canopy. This is a, a view from the street, Google view. I have some photos I'll share with you up close of the tree, but you can see the tree. This is a survey of the property. Um, very nice garden. Uh, you know, this tree is growing in the, in the right angle of uh, what appear or are two 19th century brick walls. It might have been, the, the walls might have been a portion of a historic structure that was there. Previously, we'll get into that. Of course, the beds are lined with brick, a very nice lawn panel, very nice yard. Here's the, uh, what we refer to as the um, uh, Sanborn maps. So this shows structures over history that were there. You can see there were a couple structures on the north property line, north of the house. 
These are photos uh, submitted by Wertimer and Klein. So again, you can get a, a feel for the garden, a very nice lawn panel edged with a bed in the tree planted in the corner. It is now um, 32 inches. I measured it today. I went back out to look at it today, uh, 32 inches versus the noted 28. Um, I believe over time the, the earth has risen. I think a lot of leaf mold has gathered there over the years. Um, the, the letter referenced that they planted it 50 years ago. Um, you know, live oaks tend to rise up out of the ground, a typical uh, textbook root flare and what have you. You can see the wall. This shows more of the, the structural damage to the wall. And uh, the letter from the Arbus will speak to uh, an effort to stop the damage from the tree uh, via excavating and trenching along the wall and doing some root pruning, but uh, the tree is still applying pressure and root pressure against the wall. So they're fearful that it's going to fall. Um, you can see the crack and it's lean towards the west. Uh, structural folks have looked at it, and of course the arborist. Uh, Ari Fun, a noted uh, arborist in town, uh, evaluated the tree May 30. This letter is written and it talks about a 36 inch DBH oak. I measured 32. Um, and he speaks about two years ago, his team performed root pruning, giving about a six inch space between the roots and the wall. The Mason team then came in and did some repair work. And the, you know, after backfilling that little six inch trench, uh, he feels the roots have maybe accelerated in growth a little bit, uh, you know, new roots from the, the pruning cuts and applying pressure on the wall. And there is a grade differential between this side and the other side of the wall, uh, which I'll allow the applicant to speak more to, but. Uh, So we have a couple of letters of support that were actually submitted with the application. Uh, so these didn't come in via our innovation site. So one of them is uh, dated May 24th from Historic Charleston Foundation. I won't read the entire letter unless you feel I need to, but um, basically the foundation has an exterior easement on two Latson and it's come to their attention that uh, you know, the tree is causing and compromising the structural integrity of the early 19th century wall. And they feel that it's formally part of an outbuilding. Um, the foundation you know, supports the, Charleston's, the city of Charleston's tree protection ordinance and the laws uh, governing grand trees, but they believe an exception should be made in this case to protect the historic wall. And, uh, you know, then it speaks to Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Cahill um, making their efforts to try and save the wall. The second letter is from uh, Lane Ackerman, um, resides at Nine Wimes Court, and they're in support of the removal of the wall. Uh, for fear it's leaning toward their yard. Third letter submitted from 2A Latson Street, uh, Thomas Kirkland, uh, 50 years ago when he was the current owner of 2 Latson, his daughter Betsy as a little girl and her mother planted the live oak in the corner. They watched it grow, provide shade, but now they feel um, that they can also support Betsy and her husband, John, in the effort to mitigate the damage to the historic wall. These are the city provided photos. So I just took a nice shot of the tree um, in, the, in the corner. And then you can see the root mass, uh, you know, whether that was there uh, before the root pruning a few years ago or accelerated the growth of some roots there after severing those roots. But you can see the mass of roots against that wall and the wall splitting away in the corner and just a, a view from the top. So I believe, you know, it's I think important to consider the historic 
nature of Charleston, its gardens, and the and the elements within gardens, and the the historic nature of these walls, and with the support of the uh, historic Charleston Foundation and obviously neighbors, staff recommends approval with the condition to plant 32 caliber inches of native canopy trees on the lot. Now, that would be in the form of one two and a half inch caliber canopy tree. I hope uh, Sheila and her team could figure out a way to get a tree nestled into that small garden space. And then the residual inches, inches would be in the form of a contribution to the city street tree program. Must provide a landscape plan for staff review. And then I would hope that maybe um, the owners, interested people in the neighborhood could maybe make a good faith effort to repurpose the wood in some capacity instead of having it just chipped and hauled off to the landfill. So with that said, um, I think Scott, if we could recognize Sheila Wertimer, Betsy uh, Cahill, and Thomas Kirkland. And I don't know, Mr. Chair, if you want to swear them all in at once or individually, but. I think it'd be great to swear them all in at once. Um, wait for them to all be on. I see Ms. Cahill. Uh, oh, there's Ms. Wertimer. And Mr. Kirkland. Okay. So Mr. Kirkland will need to unmute himself. Same thing with um, Ms. Wertimer. And then I'll swear you all in. Um, Mr. Kirkland, if you can unmute yourself. He wasn't planning to speak. He was just going to send. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's fine. So let me go ahead and swear um, you all in for the record and then the floor will be yours. Um, you all swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. I do. Excellent. Um, I so, do. Okay, thank you. So y'all can go ahead, whoever speaks, just state your full name and your address, and then uh, have at it. I'll get started. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Sheila Wertimer. I'm pleased to be here. Um, this evening, although this is a very tough application. I started working with the Cahills almost, oh, probably four or five years ago to figure out ways to save this tree and save the wall and keep the garden as it presently is. And um, we have repaired, I mean, of course, the first thing we did was repair the wall. We re repaired it several different times in several different ways using bridge footings and um, if i can interrupt you real yes. quick I, I don't i'm sorry to just, i don't think you stated your address for us if you could do that oh i'm sorry yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm presently in wisconsin i'm presently <laughs> in wisconsin but my address is 154 broad street <laughs> yeah you. there you go <laughs> um as I said, we, we worked really hard uh, to repair the wall and um, try and work out ways for the, the wall and the tree to coexist. But one of the things that doesn't show up uh, clearly that the people on Weems Court and the neighbor on Ladson both um, are experiencing is the change of grade. Um, the neighboring properties uh, are actually a couple of feet, maybe 18 inches, 24 inches below the grade of this wall. So um, it really affects the settlement and um, trying to root prune has been um, ineffective. As Ari said, you know, we may have accelerated uh, the problem, but um, it, it's, it's a tough problem and um, it's the reason that we're here asking you respectfully to allow us to take down this tree and mitigate it so that we can save the historic wall. 
Um, Betsy Cahill knows much more about this than I do, so I'm going to hand it over to her, but I'll be happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you, Sheila. My name is Betsy Cahill, and I live at 2 Ladson Street, Charleston. And I thank you all for entertaining this application and, and taking time out to let me speak. Um, this is now a second generation rescue operation. My father and mother, when they were the principal owners of the house, had to repair part of the wall <clears throat> many years ago. And now my husband and I, as is detailed in the application, have made repeated attempts to save the tree and save the wall. And we have very reluctantly come to the conclusion that one of them is gonna to have to go. And um, we hope that you will agree with us that the, the wall um, is important because of its historicity and um, its sort of past role in the history of this house, which um, has been in my family for the better part of 120 years um, with a brief interlude in the 1940s. Um, but we love the house, we love the garden, and um, we, if this application is approved, look forward to working with Sheila to find something really appropriate and beautiful to go in that corner of our garden. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Schultz, Eric, are there any um, people that were registered opposed to the application or additional people who wanted to speak in favor of? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, um, we had nobody registered to speak in favor or opposed, but I did receive one written comment in support, so I'll read that now. Okay. Um, the email came through our website boards. It was submitted today. July 7th at 9.39 this morning. And it states, Dear Sirs, we are the immediate neighbors to Betsy and John Cahill at 2 Latson Street. We have one and three Latson Street directly across the street. The tree which Betsy and John want to take down has been doing considerable damage to their property for years. And we are all concerned about the eventual loss of their wall if the tree is not removed. Because the tree is toward the back of the property, the removal of the tree will not result in a, a noticeable loss of tree cover to the neighborhood. As such, we urge the board to approve the removal of the tree. Adelaide and Edward Bennett, one and three, Latson Street, and their phone number. That was all that we received. Okay, then uh, we'll close this application to the public. And it'll now be opened up to the board for um, discussion or questions um motions so but I'll, I'll start and just say that uh um thank you for the very thorough application um and uh and i i'm appreciative of the letter from uh historic uh, foundation um and in their view that the wall is pressing over the tree and i think i would agree with that i think that uh we can unfortunately plant another tree but we can't create another 19th century wall. Um, so that's my thought. I agree. <laughs> this is Ruthie. I agree as well. I think it's, uh, we all live with our gardens and we live in concert with nature and they've done the best they can with it. So I would like to make a motion to approve. Wait, hang on a second. <laughs> Andrew. Let's get Mr. Hargett's comments in here. Um, well, I'm just curious. I mean, uh, uh, I'm not for or against either. I'm just curious. I mean, it was stated, you know, this is a historic wall and all that, but then all of a sudden I got a different story that this wall has been, I guess, repaired at some point in time, several times. So, you know, is it really historic if it's been repaired? If it has been repaired, you know, how come nobody decided to drop a couple of lentils in there and raise the wall a little bit? Just curious. I mean, that, that seems to me like, you know, if you're gonna repair a masonry wall, you don't build it right back over the roots, you would you would suspend it somehow. Now, whether that's through lintel or 
posts and or pier construction or some sort, but I mean, I, it could be done, especially if the wall's been repaired previously. And it was an untouched wall and it was truly historic. It had never been repaired. Yeah, I hear you. I'm with you. But now you're talking about cutting down a, I'm sorry, was it a 32 or a 37? 32 inch, right? Yes. Oh, for a wall that really isn't truly historic. So you think a repair on a historic structure negates its historic value? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, like, what were the repairs? You know, we, how expensive were they? And, you know, the... Yes, Sheila. Sheila had referenced um, looking into bridge footings, I believe. Is that a question for yes. Sheila? Yeah, I'd like Sheila to, to just yeah. go into a little more detail about what they looked at. For sure. Andrew. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, we did. Uh, Andrew, we, um, when I say we repaired the wall, we certainly never took it down and rebuilt it. It is still all historic fabric. What okay. we did do um, was on several occasions was to one, put in a bridge footing that um, uh, extended for, I think six or seven feet. And um, the roots are so extensive that it's uh, um, impacting all along the wall. So the wall would have to, in essence, come down to, to really to raise it up. I got you. We also, <sighs> we also um, worked on it further down the property, but the, the real kicker is that the neighboring properties are so much lower than the K Hills that um, it's, it's, it's just a, real structural problem at this point. But the, the, the historic fabric of the wall is intact. I and that. it's and been repaired. But it has, you need the retention so that right. the neighbors don't get washed onto. Right, right. exactly, I got exactly. You. Okay. All right, now Ruthie, I think you can make a motion if you want. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve with staff recommendations. A second. Okay, so motion by Ms. Ravenel, second by Ms. Barton, and I'll just do it. Um, if uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Anybody, anybody opposed? No, yeah, so then this motion is, is approved seven to zero. Um, we thank you for your time and your application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions, Andrew. I try, you know, I just, you know. Well, when she volunteered that they fixed the wall previously, sometimes these people's fixes are rather <laughs> well, Sh Sheila would never do that. She She's excellent. I'm sure she worked very hard to, to save it. I, I feel for them because there's a lot of people downtown who really are devastated when they have to take anything out. Yeah. All right. So our next item on the application is item B2 at 75 Chadwick Drive. Um, the application number is 210707B2. The TMS number 42109000019. Request the variance from section 54327 to allow the removal of two grand trees uh, zoned SR1. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is the application submitted by Elizabeth Pope on behalf of the owners, Thomas and Courtney Wagner. And um, I do have to correct um, uh, in the rush to get this done. It seems like I never have enough time and I kind of fly solo. So I don't always have somebody double check my work, but uh, the application obviously was for a grand tree, a bald cypress, and then a grand, uh, flowering pear or Bradford pear. The Bradford pear actually would require a special exception, but you'll see in my presentation that I'm going to grant staff level approval for that tree. I view it as a hazardous tree due to the branching pattern. We also know that the 
Bradford pear is a is a uh, invasive <laughs> species. So uh, that is not really on the table. So it's basically a, a variance to remove one grand tree. Just want to make okay. that clear. Thank you. Uh, this property is located not on the marsh side or the Stoner River side of Chadwick. It's on the interior, zoned SR1. You can see that there are what I would call three grand trees across the frontage. The Bradford pear is planned north of Chadwick next to the driveway. Then you have the bald cypress. And then although I didn't measure it, but I observed, I would think that a cedar tree Land south would be considered a grand tree as well. You can see it in just a moment. You can see the cedar tree, a few of its branches just off the right of the screen, the bald cypress in the middle, and then the Bradford pear, which is also uh, being heavily pruned by Dominion Energy on their rotation. And I believe a few branches come off the bald cypress as well when Dominion performs their rotation pruning work. This is the site plan. Uh, you have the Bradford pear again, the red circle to the top, the brat or the bald cypress uh, adjacent to the sidewalk, and then the cedar tree. These are the photo photos submitted by the applicant. So you can see the Bradford pear, which is not an issue. It's branching pattern. I'm, I'm surprised it hasn't split apart yet. Um, and then the blue tick marks, if you will, on the middle photo show all the uh, knees that are being formed by the bald cypress. But because it's been a lawn, they're kind of kept in check, if you will, due to lawn mowing operations. So they're not, you know, they're not going vertical as uh, a, a true bald cypress knee that you would, might think of, but uh, they are peppered all across the lawn. Uh, this photo shows the water meter and the water line in proximity to the tree, and then an overall uh, front shot. This is a letter uh, from their consulting arborist. Uh, he speaks of a 28 inch diameter bald cypress. I measured 25.3, we'll call it 25. Uh, the species is known for displaying numerous knees surrounding the entire tree close proximity to the foundation, plumbing, underground plumbing, and then the Bradford pear, um, you know, is not an issue. These are my shots of the Bradford pear, just to confirm that I, I'm going to call it as a staff level approval. These are my shots of the bald cypress. Um, you can see it is the tree closest to the masonry structure. Uh, so the inset bottom left is all those little brown circle marks are clipped off knees trying to form. And you can see that they're throughout the lawn. And then of course, a side shot of the tree. Um, if you have observ observed, I'm kind of speaking factual. Um, I'll let you all discuss the merits of the variance um, amongst yourselves. But um, so these are my staff recommend, uh, uh, recommendations. The Bradford pair is determined to be hazardous due to branching configuration and attachment class five. If the bald cypress is approved, uh, must plant 25 caliber inches of native canopy trees on the lot in the form of two and a half inch make a contribution to the city street tree program. You wouldn't get all that many inches and then provide a landscape plan for uh, review and approval. So I wanna really kick it over to Elizabeth Pope, the landscape architect working with the owners and have them um, further explain their application. So uh, Robin Robinson, and Elizabeth Pope, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry, Robin. Uh, Robin is, I think, attending. She actually had some questions about item number three, so we don't want to identify her or unmute her. I'm sorry, just Elizabeth Pope. I'm sorry. 
Hey, Elizabeth Pope, can you hear me? Yes, we got you, Miss Pope. Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to swear you in uh, for the record, then if you would state your full name and address, OK? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So I hope you got. I do. Excellent. The floor is, is yours. OK, I'm Elizabeth Pope and I my address is 264 Meeting Street, um, 164. Well, 164 Meeting Street, um, number 264, Charleston, South Carolina. And I am here just to talk about removing the um, bald cypress. So the bald cypress that is in the center of their front yard poses two risks to the Wagner's property. The first risk is to the main water line, as you see on the site plan. Bald cypress are known for their aggressive root systems. Um, they grow deep. Last year, I had a client that had a bald cypress and it did take out their water line. And this, seeing the water line this close um, is a risk. And it's one that I like to bring up. The second risk is the one that it poses um, to their children. You know, you want to look at the knees as Eric brought up and bald cypress, the more knees that you see when a bald cypress is planted, it means that the ground is more saturated and wet. Bald cypress native habitat is a swamp and more they grow widely in very wet places. And bald cypress, the more knees you see, the more wet the soil is. The only real way to mitigate this risk of getting rid of the knees is to remove the tree. There is no way to keep the knees in check. And the knees keep popping up and having the knees that close and taking over the whole front yard in proximity to children playing and causing a problem to them and to the water line is something to consider. The homeowners are happy to replant and to mitigate um, like what was proposed. They like trees, but this tree is um, just not suited for a small city yard. It's uh, too large. All right. Um, is that is that out? Is that all you have? It is. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So, Eric, is there anybody that uh, registered to speak in favor or oppose the application? Uh, nobody registered to speak in favor or oppose. Uh, Elizabeth, do you want me to read your email that you shot me to yesterday? I, mean, yes. I think you've covered most of it, but I'll, I'll read it in. So Elizabeth shot me a, uh, an email yesterday, uh, Tuesday, July 6 at 2.53. Uh, may I please register to speak in reference to the tree removal I submitted BZA uh, in the ID number. Elizabeth Pope, registered landscape architect, phone number July 7th. I am asking to remove the 28 inch bald cypress that is less than one foot from the water main of 75 Chadwick. Bald cypress trees are known for their aggressive root system and this tree's roots are already causing damage to the existing walkway. Their above ground knees roots are popping up across the yard and are also against the house foundation. The house is not meant, the tree is not meant for a small garden. The second tree asking for removal has already been permitted, I was unaware. So, yeah, so uh, any further questions for Elizabeth or for discussion? I, oh, I'm sorry, I'm taking over for you, Joel, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so then uh, what we will do is we'll close this application to the public and to be open to the board for discussion. Um, and, uh, and I'll start again and say that uh, it does appear that it was just a poorly planned species for uh, for the yard. Um, I do have a question on, you know, so if the tree is removed, how, how did the knees just decay, disappear, or do you basically have to regrade the whole lot to, to get rid of all that and then new sod? You regrade and re regrade and new sod. New sod. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, all right, well, that's, that's 
my only two cents, I guess, on it. Um, Board members, let me know if you want to go back to see a specific slide or not. Let me just let me know. Is I have a question. Is the water line leaking? I am not sure yet. It is just less than a foot and it is making me very nervous just from what happened last year with one with, you know, you see the proximity of it being less than a foot away. Do we know what the pipe material is? I do not. It's probably original. Um, but would that be clay or, or iron then? I would think it would be copper or iron. Iron. I would say Chad, copper. I would, Chadwick, I would say it's copper. Yeah. Copper soft. Have we um, seen other um, applications like this in the past um, with the same kind of situation, Garrett? Uh, to my knowledge, we have had applications in front of the board over my tenure with the city where I have denied a tree that was uh, deemed as causing structural damage to a habitable residence where somebody, where I, I kind of disagreed that maybe we didn't do enough root excavation to really determine whether the tree was causing damage to a habitable residence. So the ordinance reads, there's two standards. One is whether the tree is deemed hazardous, uh, irreparably damaged or infested with bugs or insects. The second standard reads that staff can approve a tree, a grand tree, if it's causing structural damage to a habitable residence and there's deemed no remedy, meaning we can't root prune and put in root barrier and that sort of thing. This in my, I cannot recall a case where we're looking at a healthy tree, this particular species and having this many evident, this, you know, the evidence of the knees in this uh, uh, capacity or density of knees. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of bald cypress in gardens and we actually plant some on public right away, but uh, this is, and, and I, Elizabeth it is true. It's, I mean, it, her statement that they like wet places and that's what accelerates the formation of knees, I believe is the, um, it's the tree's way of uh, seeking additional oxygen, I believe in wet situations. I thought, I thought the, um, all the whys of uh, Cypress knees still had some unknowns about them. I'm just throwing that out there as a, as a yeah, I mean, I think you're probably right. The, you know, stability, you know, a means of the tree uh, making itself more stable in swampy, wet areas, oxygen intake. I pulled uh, up Michael Durr's book before this, and he talks about oxygenation for the roots. And, you know, that's the wetter the soil is why they pop up. And that's why you can't root prune a bald cypress in that big of an area when it's spreading that many knees. Yeah because you can't get rid of the soil. You know, you can't fix the soil over that large of an area. We actually didn't ask for a okay. response, but thank you. Um, Andrew, what do you think? Uh, yeah, this was a tough one, right? Um, personally, I, you know, I mean, I understand the water line that's, uh, in fact, at my old house behind Blessed Sacrament, I had a live oak break my water line and I had to repair it and essentially repair it with a loop of PEX uh, so that it gives it more flexibility so you're not breaking the water line again in five years. Uh, uh, you know, Denise, yeah, I get it. I, my problem honestly is not sure there's a hardship here. And I think that's why you saw Eric's uh, real hesitant to make any, any things because, you know, I sympathize and empathize with the plight. And if I could get a nail drilled into the wall that gives me a hardship, sure. But eh, I don't understand what the hardship is. I'm having some issues there. So if somebody can tell me, you know, that, 
I'm down with it. But knees, is, is that really a hard I, I I mean, I'm having a hard time. I, I don't think it would be by code. Yeah, I know what you mean. I'm kind of on the fence too, but you know, bald cypress are typically growing in, in swampy conditions, right? Not in. They actually can take dry conditions too. Okay. They're pretty flexible. And they don't have, yeah, they don't have knees in the dry conditions. So, right, right. Yeah. Their, native, their native condition is in a, a moist area. So the bigger question you, is Eric, go ahead. Sorry. Jeff. I, I was just going to ask Eric if he could put up the application to, to see if what was what was um, listed as the hardship or the, yeah I believe it was the water line the proximity to the water line and and um, uh, breaking that uh, which is understandable because uh, it's very clear that the water company will not pay for any damage to that water line from the meter to the house it is yeah. owner's responsibility um, I guess the question I would have is is uh, why is the lot um, why is the lot so wet if these knees keep popping up and it's only, they only, the tree only does that when it's experiencing, you know, the, the wet conditions. Um, is it possible that there's a slow leak or a small leak in that water line already that just continually, you know, is letting water out and causing that yard to, 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 to be wet. I don't, I don't know. I, as far I as a hardship, be, go ahead. Joel, Joel, I would argue more so that, um, my observation as I drove through the neighborhood today, um, there's no, no roadside swale here per se, and the road is somewhat crowned. So I think sheet flow off the road puts the okay. water in the front, in the, in the front yard. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's a very, it's a pretty wet neighborhood down there. It gets, you can hold water for sure when there's storms this season. So do we, it is, uh, do, go ahead, Jeff. Based on this age, do we, this tree, do we think it was planted there? I mean, it was yeah, I would say. way younger than Windermere, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, bald cypress is notorious for growing fast. Um, you know, they can, they can jump pretty quick. So it'd be hard to estimate its exact age, but, you know, uh, 25 inches, you know, I would say it's probably frozen in on 60 years. 70. Eric. What's the uh, typical lifespan? Oh, 400. 500. 400. Yeah, so it's an infant. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Liberty tree that was up there off the, uh, uh, you know, there's still that, is that, uh, there's an old stump, like it's tall, like 25 feet up there off of, uh, towards the end of Rutledge where that moving and storage facility is. There's an old big bald cypress trunk still there because oh, you know, bald cypress doesn't rot. Right. I don't know. I, I would. Uh, <clears throat> so this is where emotion has to be taken out of it because the emotion would say, if I'm the homeowner, I want that tree grown too. I, don't, I, don't want that, I want my, I want my yard looking like that. Um, then the question uh, is, what's the precedent? Yeah, but there's not there's nothing in the standard that talks about um, emotion. Have you had a? I have a question um, for Elizabeth. Have Have you? Um, has a structural engineer anyone looked at the proximity of the roots near the house? Because you said that they were getting really close, and I'm just wondering if they're are they starting to experience any damage? You know with the structure itself. I don't think they've had it looked at yet, but I showed some pictures of how close they are. Can we go back and see this, Eric? So you can see the middle photo, correct me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth. Uh -huh. I think you, you circled everything in, in oh, yeah. blue. Blue, it looks like the knees near the steps. And yeah. yeah, I guess I didn't do one that was like, if there's like at the, they're at the foundation. Okay. If I, I guess, I guess one thing I would say is, if people are, um, if people are leaning towards not seeing um, 
the hardship, would it be worthwhile to get a little more information on um, deferring and getting more information and looking at the proximity of the roots to the structure and getting an opinion on that? Um, and uh, I would also say, you know, have they had any um, you know, increase in, in uh, water bills? I agree with you that it could just be um, runoff. It's a little hard to tell, you know, what grade wise is happening between the lot and the street, but um, it looks kind of like it slopes towards the street. So you wouldn't think it would be holding water, right? Unless it's uh, I think I think this photo here, if you look at this photo here, the larger picture up top right, where my vehicle sitting in the car, you can definitely see a slope in that lawn. Yep, 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 the, yep. The, 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 uh, on that one. The actual uh, dumpster container is lower than the truck. So it, it definitely slopes down. It's not much, but it does yep. shed water into the front yard. So I would say that if it's not a, a huge issue, I think that it would be more beneficial to the applicant to defer because it gives them a chance to come come back without it being a, an appeal um, and see if we could get could get some information on I guess a better clarification of the hardship because the the what if of the water line I understand it um, but uh, but I don't know that that meets the hardship test. Um, unless the hardship is just who would plant that tree in that in that location, um, but uh, similar to the other, who would plant the oak tree, um, you know, five feet from a wall. Uh, so, but, so, but that's not it. Go ahead, Andrew. Said the owners did. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, for the lady that yeah. sat it down. Yeah. The the. Part of the test is the it unreasonably restrict or prohibit the use of the property. I don't think it's going to we can get to prohibit, but does it unreasonably restrict the, the use of the property? And it it definitely restricts your ability to mow that grass. Oh yeah. Well, and you have to mow it otherwise they'd be. And and it, and they, she did point out a, a safety issue with it. Yeah, so so maybe maybe some additional um, input on that. I agree with you, Amanda, about the safety if, 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 or the structural integrity. If there's something there, that would definitely make the case easier. That's going to be tough because I mean, the crawl you know the crawl space is most likely dry. Let's hope it is. You know, the tree roots aren't really gonna, the only time they penetrate underneath like a house like that is like downtown because there's nowhere else for the roots to go. I mean, they go where water is available. So the chances that I'm wanting to breach the footing to go underneath to bone dry soil is, I wouldn't say nil, but it's approaching now. Wouldn't be a bad idea to look though, check and look and then sure. maybe yeah, provide right. you know, yeah. if get an engineer to to provide a letter that states um, you know, the roots are already within this this proximity of that foundation. It's only a matter of time before they um, really start to breach I don't know, something that uh, that we could then Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. that's what I'm saying, Joel. The chances of them breaching that are practically I know, I know but uh, <laughs> You know, if there's if it's one in a million, we say there's still a chance. <laughs> You're saying they got a chance. That's right. <laughs> so I would uh, I would just say that um, if it, the consensus of the board seems that we wouldn't have a, a, a majority for approval, then I think we ought to defer and see if we can allow them to come back with maybe a little more information versus a denial. I'd be in favor of that. Is that a motion that we make or? It would be, you'd have to make the motion for de deferral. I'll make the motion for deferral. I think 
I agree with every everyone's thoughts. All right, so there is a motion for deferral by Ms. Ravenel. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it, Joel. All right, so seconded by Mr. Webb, and I'll, I'll just do the roll on this one. Wait, um, uh, just say, can we make sure that we give Elizabeth some direction? I mean, even if it's after the vote, I don't really care, but I, I think we should tell her what we're looking for. Yeah, I think that we've we've um, done some of that, and just that we need to we need the smoking gun, as they say, because um, we we are struggling with it meeting the hardship test to allow the approval, okay. and um, and so um, maybe just a little more investigation and the the roots and where they are towards the house. Um, if there's any any photo that can be provided that's enlarged or damaged, I would even go as far as say to the sidewalk. Because uh, if it's busted up the sidewalk, it's going towards those stairs. Um, and I think that one picture she showed it was like those little knees were pretty close to those stairs um, <clears throat> at the front. All those little blue dots, like there's a couple blue circles um, towards the uh, towards the stairs up there. But um, that would, I guess, that would be my my direction. So that, have to expand on how it really meets that hardship test. Mm -hmm. I want to approve it, but and, um, we just got to make sure it meets the test. And maybe checking what the material of the line is. Because um, I sure. talked about that, that can make a difference too in terms of the integrity of, of the pipes. Okay. Um, All right. And is there any structural damage being caused with, you know, with the, with, with the house and then just you know the owners also just might want to check and see if you know has their water bill gone up okay you know because right. that's you know sometimes you don't even know that you have you know you could have the a leaking water pipe and you don't necessarily know it um you know and a lot of people just auto pay their bills you know and don't know that it went up 30 dollars a month or whatever sure sure all right so let's do uh Let's do the roll. So, Ms. Ravenel. Aye, in favor. Ms. Barton. Aye, in favor. Ms. Murphy. Aye, in favor. Mr. Webb. Aye, in favor. Mr. Eugene. Aye, in favor. Argent. Um, yeah, sure. Aye, in favor. Okay. Mr. Adrian's aye, in favor. So, the deferral is 7 to 0. Um, Thank you for the, uh, the application. I hope that we've given you some, some yep. guidance and um, we'll look forward to seeing what you come back with. We'll come back. I'll get some more information. All right, August, thank you. August 4th, thank you. August 4th will be the meeting. Wednesday, August 4th. Okay, thanks. You'll be at, you'll be at the top of the agenda. All right, very good. Thank you all. I caution you, Joel, on the water line or Amanda on that water line. I don't think that the water line is going to meet the hardship either. I mean, they'll just tell you to fix it. I mean, that's not really going to meet the variance hardship test. The so foundation? Yeah, I would definitely focus on foundation. And, uh, you know, I think I think uh, Jeff hit on it, too. I think if you make a good, plausible argument that you can't use the front yard if the knees are allowed to grow, I would probably strike on that as well because that is a restriction of your property. Property use. Well, I talked about that with the safety, too, aspect. So... Yeah, so you're gonna have to work on the safety though. Okay, so just see it as a. I don't see it really as a hazard. Okay. Is there a way? Is there a way to um to to map out and, and be able to show that uh, these knees are are taking up um you know 475 square feet of the 1,000 square foot front yard. You know, so you got that site plan. You can kind of just you know map it then we would be able to see a percentage and then we would know good golly yeah it's you know 75 percent of this person's front yard is is consumed by this tree um that might be a way to to better inform and, and is there any imbalance in the tree from the dominion cutting yes what you can see in the pictures but i'll do i can show some more okay andrew what would you plant back there to suck up some water 
Sycamore is a good one for that. I plan it closer to the road, though, and uh, away from the water line. And uh, you could also do pond cypress because pond cypress doesn't get the knees. So they, your homeowners probably would be like, oh, hell no, though, because you know, if they hear the word cypress, they will. The other thing <laughs> in there is cedar because cedar uh, also transpires a pretty fair amount of water and it'll take that moisture. We'll do it. And uh, black right. gum. Black gum's another good one. Thank you. Or, or call black two below. Thank you. So, um, have a great, great evening. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. That concludes the Board of Zoning Appeals meeting for um, July 7th. Excellent. Eric, thanks as always.